In case you haven't heard, Axiom is a building mod that has been revolutionizing the Minecraft community with its amazing tools to create rocks, slopes, curves, gradients, and so much more. But as for every new mod, learning how to use it might not be easy. Well hello, and welcome to this tutorial series where we will be covering some of the most useful functionalities of Axiom and learn how to explore its capabilities to the maximum, so that you can create stuff like this and anything you can imagine, or almost. Today we will explore different ways to bring color to your builds, in particular we will be seeing the painting tool, the gradient painter, the replace tool and the noise patterns, applied to some rocks as an example, along with some of the basics of using Axiom. So without further ado, let's go! Let's start with a quick run through some of the basics of Axiom. When you first enter the world, you will see this extra slot here. For now, ignore that, we won't use it. On this corner, you will be seeing every one of my key presses. That's a feature that you can toggle on and off within Axiom, and I will be highlighting some important ones, so if you have any doubts, just look over there. When we press and hold the left alt key, we will be facing this extended menu called the Builder Mode. On the left side, we will see a bunch of different tools, I'll go through them so you can see the names, but don't worry about those for now. They are super useful, but we'll cover them later on. Up top, you can change the game mode, which is pretty straightforward. On the bottom right corner, there's this toolbox that opens a new set of options. Here's where we can toggle on and off the key presses that you see on screen, for instance. We can also change the liquid opacity. So when we have water, it basically lets us see through it until it's invisible. We can modify the minimum brightness on top of the vanilla settings, which removes every shadow when it's at 100%, like if you have night vision. I suggest turning type replace on, this will allow us to easily replace certain blocks like stairs and trapdoors in the future. And the last two options are related to the camera movement and flight. I like to put this on horizontal and with the flight momentum close to 40 or 50, but I encourage you to play with different settings there to see what you like the most. The option on top is called Infinite Reach, which we first need to toggle on from the tools on the left, right here. And now we can place and break blocks no matter how far they are. And back in the toolbox you can reduce the distance, so it's not infinite, but larger than regular creative mode. For instance, something like 35 is good enough for me. Ok, now let's get into the important stuff. When we press right shift, we enter the editor mode. I know this screen can be a bit scary at first, but trust me, it's not that terrible once you get used to it. So, the first challenge we'll find here is the camera. In the editor mode, the movement of the player, or camera as I like to call it, has some new functionalities that can get confusing at first, so let's quickly go through a few of them. For a start, by holding left click you can move the world around you, sort of, and doing the same with the right click will move the camera instead. Something useful is that you can scroll your mouse wheel to quickly zoom in and out, and bear in mind that when you leave the editor mode, your player will be in the position you left the camera looking. So basically what you're doing is moving your player around. The most useful feature in my opinion for the camera is that while holding the left control key and right clicking on any block of the world, you can drag around and you will go in a sphere around that specific block that you clicked first. So, if you are closer to the block you will be moving less, while if you are further apart you will be moving a longer distance around the place. It takes some time to get used to this feature, but it's very much worth it to learn it in the end. And for the rest, you can always remember that you are still in Minecraft Creative, so you can move by flying like you would do in any regular creative world. Here you can adjust your flying speed from the menu we've seen before, and it becomes super useful to move around. Alright, now that we are done with all those needed basics, let's start painting. To explain this, I prepared those blocks of wool that we've already seen before, and the idea here is to paint them with different tools to achieve different effects that might be useful for any projects you may have. Specifically, we will try to make them resemble rocks. On the editor tab, we will go over to Magic Selection. This tool, when in block mode, selects all the blocks of the same type that are adjacent or connected with each other. Depending on the size of the block you want to select, you might need to increase the parameters on the left, or else make a few extra clicks to make sure everything that you want is selected. Now that we have that outline with yellow, we can go over to the painter tool and to the right we will find this block, which for default is a block of stone. We can increase the size of the brush on the left, and as you can see, now every time I right click over the outline blob, it will paint it with stone. However, a few things to consider, right now by default it's set to mask surface on. This option will only paint the blocks that are exposed to the air or on the surface, as the name suggests. So if we go and break inside, we can see that the interior is still yellow wool. Depending on what you want to do, you might need to turn it off or on, that's up to you. 
Something very important is that you can always undo your actions in the editor mode by pressing Ctrl Z. So if you make any mistakes, you can easily go back. Now, we can also see that there are other shapes for the brush. Sphere is the default, but we can go to Q and Octahedron that they might come in handy for any specific things that you may want to achieve in your builds. So I'll go ahead and choose a sphere and make sure I paint the entire blob. Okay, this blob is done, so let's go and paint the other one. Let's repeat the same process. We go back to Magic Selection, right-click on the second blob, and what happened is that now both blobs are selected. So if we were to paint now, we would be painting both, and we don't want that. So to fix that issue, we have a few options. Option number one, under the Magic Selection tool, we can see that right here is set to add. This is the default, but if we change it to replace, when we click the new blob, it will forget the last selection and make a new one. Option number two, let's say we like to keep it on add, well, then we need to clear the previous selection. For that, we can go up here under selection and the first box says clear. We hit that and it's done, the selection is gone. Now we can make a new one. Option number three, and this is my favorite, we just hit enter on the keyboard and that automatically clears the previous selection. So now, let's paint the other blob with Tuff, for example. And that's it, that's all you need to know about the Painter tool. Okay, so now we have the blobs painted, and yes, they look a bit more like rocks, but let's say we want to make it more realistic and not just a plain single color. For that, we can do some shading with the Gradient Painter tool. The idea here is to make it look like some parts are brighter than the others, and this can happen for many reasons. For example, we can imagine that the sun is illuminating the rocks from a certain angle, or there might be a cliff somewhere casting a shadow over the rocks, or it can even be weathered because the water ran through it at some point. The limit for that is your imagination, and believe me, it can be very useful to think of what natural reasons are affecting your build and use that information to visualize how it would look like to paint it later on. So for example, in this case, let's do something simple. Let's imagine that the sun is hitting the rock from an angle coming from this direction. So with that in mind, we would think that this top part of the rock should be brighter and as we move away, it should get darker. Something like this is what I have in mind. We have that idea now, but which blocks do we use to paint? We would have to select a color palette or something. Well, not yet. For now, we are gonna choose four colors of wool, going from white to black and we will use that to paint the rocks in the first place. So let's go and click on the Gradient Painter tool, and right here we can choose the blocks of our palette. By default, there's always two, and we can add more by clicking on the plus sign. As for the previous Painter tool, we can also change it to Max Surface, the size of the brush, and the shape if we want so. Down here, you can see all these new other settings, but before getting to those options, let's see how to use the tool. The way this works is very intuitive, we need to right-click one point where we want to paint, and as you can see, a line will appear with a number. This is telling us basically the direction in which the gradient will be applied. Once we have that direction that we want, we just click and drag with the brush to paint the terrain. The default settings are plain and nearest, which gives us a very nice layer defect, with thicker layers when the percentage of the block is higher. If we choose a sphere, it will do the same, but with circles. Changing to a linear interpolation, we can see that we can no longer modify the percentages, but instead we see a randomized seed. This gives us a smoother and more mixed transition between the different blocks of our palette. If we don't like it, we can always change the seed and do it again. Down here we can see the locking feature, where we can choose to lock in position 1 or position 1 and 2. This refers to the first blocks we click to set the gradients. This can be very useful to paint big structures with a single gradient or to make a radiating pattern from a single block. Something wise to do before is to select the blocks that we want to paint, using the magic tool as we learned before. Locking position 1 and 2 allows us to move around the structure and maintain the same gradient direction across it all. Bezier interpolation works in a very similar way and as you can see it's way more mixed and noisy. And the last option is to enable clamp to edge which basically makes it so we can't go further than the blocks we click to set the gradient direction in the first place. Okay, so far so good, but why are we painting with black and white? Well, if you remember what we said earlier, the idea was to shade these rocks in a way that it looked like the sun was hitting them from a certain direction. And sometimes shading directly with the color palette that we want is not an easy task. It takes time and practice to identify the blocks of similar colors within Minecraft that are brighter than the others. So for this part, what I like to do, and what I recommend doing sometimes, especially if you are starting to use gradients, is to paint dark and bright areas with black, grey, light grey and white wood. 
Those four colors are very easy to identify, and in this way we will be able to focus entirely on getting the shape of the shadows correctly. So moving forward, we said that the sun was hitting the rocks in this direction, coming from there, so we will use the gradient tool to paint the top part with white wool, and it will get darker as it moves down and away from the sun. And always remember that if you make any mistakes or you don't like the results, with Ctrl Z you can very easily undo your previous actions and start over. For the second rock, we can imagine that the first one is casting sort of a shadow over it, so with the gradient tool again and the sphere mode we can try to simulate that. We have to make sure to select only the second rock, so now we click and drag and we have a basic shading done in no time. Bear in mind that most of the time the shading might require some hand tweaking to achieve the exact results that you want, so don't be afraid to go in and change blocks until you are happy with the outcome. For this something very useful is the replace mode, and to activate it we have to leave the editor mode and go back to the tools that we saw at the beginning. Right here we can toggle on and off the replace mode which under the control settings is hotkey to toggle on and off with R, but I like to change it to Y so it doesn't overlap. This tool basically allows us to right click a block and change it without necessarily breaking it. Be careful though because these actions can't be undone with control Z like in the editor tab, but for sure it helps make the process of hand tweaking your builds a lot faster. So now that we have the shading done, we must change the wool blocks to the actual blocks that we want to use. Here is where we have to decide on a color palette. In this case, we are going to use brown blocks to make it look earthy. So, let's select dirt for the bright brown, spruce planks that will replace the light grey wool. Instead of grey, we will have brown terracotta, and for the darkest color we can do black terracotta. Now that we have our four color palette, we can paint the rocks with it, so let's go back to the editor mode. To replace the blocks, we first have to select them, and for that we have a few options. We could use the magic selection tool, again, and right click on the white wool for example. Then we go up here to Operations, Replace, this will open up a small window where to the left you can choose the block to replace from, in this case white wool, and to the right the destination block, in this case dirt. With that chosen we just need to hit replace and that's it, the white wool is converted to dirt. The problem of this methodology is that depending on how sparse the gradient is or the shape that you are painting, the magic selection can leave some blocks behind so it's not the most efficient in this scenario. What we can do to avoid that is to use another selection type, like the box one. We can minimize the replace tab so we don't lose that and click on box select. When we right click with this tool on the rocks, a transparent box will appear with a few arrows that are called gizmos. If you click and drag them around, you can make the box larger in each dimension until the entire build is covered. A common mistake here is to use the box selection and leave it without pressing enter, this looks like it's selected when it actually is not, and if we try to use the replace tool we will see that it's grayed out and it won't let us hit replace. To fix that we just need to hit enter and once we see the yellow lines it means it is actually selected and we can do the replacing now. So there we have it. Now we can repeat the process, do the same thing over and over for all the other types of wool, the grey, the light grey and the black, and very easily get the rocks painted. Alright. So far everything is good, we have our rocks painted, it's decent, we like it, but there's a problem. Let's suppose that now we have a color palette that consists of more than just 4 blocks. How do we paint them? Well, before learning how we can do that, let's see how we can actually choose a color palette that is more complex than just 4 blocks. For that we will use an external tool called Hue Blocks. Being honest, Minecraft has a lot of blocks currently in the game, which is a good thing, but it can be very tricky to remember all the options that we have, so assisting ourselves with other available tools is always a good idea. So as I said before, the site we are going to use is called Hueblocks, which is specifically useful for gradients, and how do we use this one? Quite simple actually. When we open it, we will find ourselves with this beautiful screen. We can click on one extreme and choose a color, let's say like yellow, and on the other side we choose a second stream, just like this. We hit generate block gradients and down here we will see the gradient translated into Minecraft blocks. If we hover over it will show us the name of each block in case we have any doubts. We can also increase the size of the gradient to 25 instead of 9 and we can even type a custom number like 50 for example. In this case it didn't really change because we have the height duplicates turned on which essentially ignores any block that repeats itself. I wouldn't in general go further than a 9 block gradient but that depends on the scale of your build, so feel free to play around. Another useful thing here is that we can choose blocks instead of color for the extremes. 
So by clicking on this icon over the gradient, it will open up a list of all the blocks in the game ordered alphabetically from up to down. Here you can choose the specific blocks on the extreme of your gradient, which is what I tend to do most of the cases. Let's say red sandstone and lime terracotta. And now we get a gradient between those two blocks. So, in our case, for our rocks, let's go from the blocks we had selected before. Black terracotta for the dark stream and rooted dirt for the bright one. Let's turn off duplicates and now we have our gradient. Sometimes the palettes obtained from hue blocks are very good, some other times not so much. But it's always a great starting point, especially if you are not very familiar with gradients in Minecraft. Now yes, back in the game. How do we paint? Here we can't use replace like before because our palette consists of more than 4 blocks. So how do we actually do it? What I like to do here is to break down our palette into 4 segments and associate those segments to each color of wool. Something like this for example. Now, we can use for instance the gradient painter tool again to paint each color of wool with each segment of our color palette. But first we need to make sure to select only the white wool. Again, here we could use the magic selection tool. Even if it leaves some blocks behind, it's a good approximation, it doesn't need to be perfect. But if we want it to be perfect, what we can do is to use the tool masks from up here. This is an incredible useful feature, but it's not easy or intuitive in most cases. I plan to make a tutorial exploring what advanced things we can do with it in the future, but for now, since what we want is to only select a type of block, we can just do this, which is fairly simple, we drag and drop block from here into the yellow line and select the block that we want to replace, which in this case is white wool. We can minimize the tool mask so it doesn't bother us. So, either with the selection or with the mask, we can drag the gradient as we learned before and get the white part painted with our chosen segment of the palette. We then go ahead and repeat the same process for the different colors of wool. With a few iterations and patience, we can get the rocks fully painted with a more complex color palette the way we like it. And now we can make it more complicated. Let's imagine we don't want to use a gradient for each color of wool, so another option we have is to use the noise painter tool. This tool is not only useful for painting but also for terrain creation, but that aspect will be covered in another tutorial, so for now let's see how we can use this to paint the rocks. When we click Noise Painter, we will see similar settings as for all the brushes we've seen before. Under Noise, we can open this and see a bunch of names. In case you're not familiar with them, these are different noise patterns. There are six of them currently in Axiom, and you don't really need to remember or understand them because down here you have a very useful preview of the pattern selected. Each of them has different settings, I leave that up to you to try and play around with, but something to mention is that you can increase or reduce the scale here which sort of works like a zoom in and out on the pattern that might be useful depending on the size of your build. The Noise Painter tool basically allows us to choose a specific pattern that we like and a block palette to paint with. Something to mention about the preview picture is that when it's white it means it will paint and when it's black it means it will not paint or in other words leave the block that was there before. When we add more blocks we can see some grays appearing to represent those new blocks. And if we increase or reduce the percentages those grays blacks and whites will change. So now let's go ahead and select the same color palette that we got on hue blocks. That way, whatever noise we choose, it will have a good and smooth transition. Then, with the tool mask set, or with the magic selection if you prefer that to differentiate the colors of wool, we can try and paint with a different setting of noise until we get something we are happy with. Playing around with this, we can achieve more complex and unique effects. In this case, I like this one where I use the whirly for all the parts. But you can even mix different noise patterns to achieve your objective. And that basically is it. Before finishing, some extra mentions. Imagine you want to go and use a bigger brush size than the maximum allowed. Well, you can control click on the bar and it will let you input text to modify it to whatever you want. So you can go below the minimum, above the maximum, or any specific number that you desire. The Bion Painter tool can also be useful in certain scenarios, since there are some blocks like water or grass that change depending on the biome, you can use this to achieve cool coloring effects that would otherwise be impossible in vanilla. We covered many different aspects of painting with Axiom today, applied to a very simple example, but the same methodology could be used on more complex terrains, structures and even organics. Next episode we will be seeing the terrain generation tools, so if there's anything related to that that you would like to see me cover, just let me know. I'm enjoying building with Axiom and I really hope you have learned something useful today. This has been Calvin, see you next time, bye bye.